Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Kaderna podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kaderna. If you've ever wondered about pharmaceuticals and how they actually get to market, whether it be Tylenol or the latest COVID booster, you're going to appreciate this episode as we dive into the merger of a high-tech world and healthcare. Our guest, Cooper Anderson, has a unique background, having moved from Wall Street in creating exchange-traded funds to pursuing a less cyclical environment through healthcare and technology. He currently serves as the Chief Financial Officer for Florence Healthcare. We discuss the rapidly growing e-clinical software industry. I finally get to learn what SAAS, or Software as a Service, really means. And we cover everything from COVID vaccines to how Big Pharma actually creates a breakthrough drug and the process to bring it to market. Cooper shares the business behind testing new drugs and how hospitals, doctors, and pharma companies innovate, collaborate, and operate together. So without further ado, here's Cooper Anderson. Is going to require work and time and sweat and toil. If money wasn't an issue, what would I be doing? Don't worry about it. You'll figure it out. Change is the only constant. The Kadena Podcast. Cooper, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Happy to be here. Yeah, thank you very much. So this was quite a background. And as I go through this, this intro here, and you hear about SAAS, I don't know if that's pronounced SAS or if it just goes by the acronym, but what exactly is that? Can you kind of clue in our listeners a little bit? Yeah, I always just call it SAS, like you just say that because there's two, two A's there in a row, but I've heard it pronounced a few different <laughs> ways. Um, it really okay. is, it is the, it is, it is sort of software in, a, in the cloud that we all sort of know and, and, and probably don't think twice about today. You know, the first SaaS company, you know, is arguably either Concur or, um, uh, or Salesforce.com. And, uh, and that, and they, they were launched in the late nineties prior to that. And that was really a function of, of internet bandwidth speeds reaching, uh, you know, sufficient level for a majority of the population to be able to, to actually access software applications just on your computer through your browser. And all of us remember above a certain age um, that software used to be delivered in, in the form of typically a, a CD-ROM that you would get in the mail or you'd buy from a computer store and you would buy sort of what's called a perpetual license, effectively buying that license indefinitely when you purchase that, that uh, CD-ROM. And um, that, you know, had, that was basically all of software up until again, like about 1998 or so, 1999. And those first two companies started to um, create, basically put these, this software application on their own servers and allow you to then ask, access that through through your browser. And that's what we all sort of know and, and sort of don't even think twice about today is that, uh, you know, you log into say QuickBooks or, or any app on, online, you're typically doing it through a browser and, and per, what's called perpetual software or CD-ROMs really don't exist anymore. Um, and it created sort of a revolution in software, uh, you know, not only from the user experience standpoint, um, but also from the finance standpoint, from the user experience standpoint, you now have this software that's always up to date. You never have to do upgrades. Like when, again, back in the, the world of CD-ROM, you had to actually go and, you know, typically buy another CD-ROM to upgrade your, your version to whatever the newest Windows or Excel was. Uh, mm-hmm. Today, all that's done automatically. It's, it's already the, the newest up to date. So it, it was a much more seamless experience um, for the user, and, and, it, and you, you don't have to download some heavy memory clogging uh, application on your computer. But from the finance side, it had profound impacts because um, the license changed from being this one-off purchase that you bought your software through to a, a recurring purchase. So think of it as almost a magazine subscription. And that was big because now you have this sort of annuitized revenue stream into the future. Um, and it, it really changed the valuations of software companies um, because Wall Street looked at this as not, we don't just have this one-off purchase where uh, a, purchase, a purchaser could be one and done for years, maybe forever if they don't ever upgrade it, to a consistent, dependable, predictable revenue stream that goes out ad infinitum into the future. 
Um, and that, you know, resulted in, in valuation steadily going higher for many or most the whole software industry, really, you know, starting in the early 2000s as Wall Street started to get their head around this new economic model. Wow. So it's kind of almost like uh, the subscription model that we're used to with Netflix or Disney Plus, but applied exactly. to pretty much any software. Yeah, that's exactly right. They, they've they even gone after it as well on the on the movie side. So it's sort of content as a service, if you will, um, to try to capture those same economics and, and valuation uplift to their stock prices as, as software saw in the early 2000s. And you certainly saw that come to fruition. You know, Netflix, uh, you know, they made several pivots um, with the last big one being over to streaming. Um, and, and that had, you know, obviously profound impacts on their valuation with it, with it soaring, although it's, it's been, you know, sort of in, in troubled waters the last few months uh, as, yeah. as, as tech markets have come off. But it is still, it's had a huge uplift because of that. And, and the other media companies have started to follow suit with their own versions of that, which has made it a little bit tougher for Netflix, too. Yep. Yeah, it's it's funny at the outset when you mentioned like the CD-ROM and it's wild. Like as soon as you said that, I don't know why, but I was thinking back to like when I got the uh, the game Doom, if you remember yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> I had you, game. Yeah, you, you just slide <laughs> the little CD in the side, put the shelf yeah. in, and then you're off and running forever. But uh, yeah, it's like that's a thing of the past. I mean, until you said that, I'm like, I can't even remember holding a CD in my hand. And now, yeah, here it all is on, on the web, you know, right at our fingertips, whatever you want, kind of instantaneous. Yeah, it's it's been a it's it's been a paradigm shift. And and, and it's just so long ago. I mean, it was literally 20 years ago. I, I think the last time I really, you know, even handled a CD-ROM, it's really they're just used for kind of cold storage now. Or, you know, a lot of desktops don't even have CD-ROM uh, yeah. as an option anymore. So, um, yeah, all that's Things gone. Things have and changed. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. They certainly have. And so when we talk about SaaS, as we say, so software as a service, mm -hmm. it, it sounds kind of like a techie thing. Is mm -hmm. that that is not your background, correct? Like, how did you I guess, how did you kind of get into this space? Well, yeah, I, you know, I um, was in I, I was doing CFO work. Uh, my original CFO job actually was at a, at a fairly young age in my early 30s. Um, when I was one of several founders of a startup on, on Wall Street that um, that we took public uh, in a, a type of exchange traded fund or ETF as they're they're often known. Um, but as I got, you know, as we got uh, to, into the late 2000 teens and we sold that business, um, I, I started to sort of reevaluate Wall Street and, and whether or not it, it was sort of going to be the same place that I recognized, say, 10 to 15 years earlier. Um, where you had these sort of the sort of wild west of um, hedge fund traders that were like George Soros is of the world and Paul Tudor Jones and stuff like that. Um, what had happened was in Wall Street, a lot of the sort of active management, it, you know, was being replaced and still is being replaced by passively managed funds, uh, index funds, such as that Vanguard really sort of was the, one of the first ones to, to start off with. And so it, it, the active, actively managed side, which was what I was always thought was kind of the fun part of it was, you know, the trading side of, of Wall Street um, became a lot thinner and kind of started to get crowded out by the movement, at least in the U.S., towards passively managed funds. So I, you know, I had an option in my career to continue on the path of once we sold our ETF business to continue uh, running other ETF businesses for other large asset management companies or pivot to another area of finance. And I had always loved technology, uh, was interested in data science, um, and had followed the software industry just, you know, from my perch up in Wall Street, and, and was attracted to software for a couple of reasons at that point, and thought that might be a cool pivot. Software, you know, first of all, the cultures are drastically different than Wall Street. And Wall Street has, has relaxed some of the stuff. But I mean, when I started, we had to wear a suit every day. Uh, you know, it was it was sort of very formal hours, very formal, formal hierarchies culturally. Um, and I felt like tech was a much more fun culture, easy going, uh, informal, a lot of smart people, but a lot of nice people. Um, the business side also was intriguing to me because I felt like a lot of, again, that Wall Street area, that, at least especially that, that I was in, 
the passively managed funds became dominated by really the top 20 asset managers um, that, you know, a list that everybody that's uh, in Wall Street be familiar with. But and you couldn't compete with them, for, at least from a passive fund standpoint, unless you had because they had just had such large marketing budgets. And so you weren't able to sort of stay above the, fr the fray and have your product recognized. And that was the reason that we became interested in selling in 2016. But software was a very different market. It was it was not so commoditized. Um, you could come up with a unique product and the margins were could be extraordinary. You're only it's also a very clean business model. You don't have the capital assets. You don't have typically uh, the layers of debt and, and capital structuring. Um, you have basically 70 percent of your expenses are really just your payroll. And the other 30% are, are sort of non-payroll stuff like, uh, you know, other software tools your developers are using and rent and things like that. So it's a clean, simple business model with high margins, with a very high growth rate across the industry. And if you could find a, a, an area of it that was early stage where there was still digitization in an industry, the growth rates uh, were really exciting uh, well into the future. Um, so you combine that with the with the, the cool cultural aspects, and um, I, I became really interested in sort of taking the skill sets and background from sort of more of a harder core Wall Street background and and focusing them into this new kind of this new exciting area. And yeah, so that's when I started this, to make that pivot. <clears throat> gotcha. And now was this when you left to Greenhaven? In, yeah. In, what so what I did twenty seventeen. What I did was, you know, I was real familiar with fairly complex businesses, very exotic uh, derivatives and, and, and financial instruments. But I wanted to spend a few years really sharpening my blade around how to get the different metrics that software uses for, from a financial standpoint, from a performance, from a productivity standpoint, how to model those businesses right. So I started doing CFO consulting through a group in Atlanta called Acuity, and I'm still good friends with the owners there. Um, uh, and they do sort of what's called fractional CFO work. Um, that means uh, a business that might need a fraction of a CFO would, um, would reach out to them to say, hey, I, I'm going to do a capital raise. I need somebody to build a financial model that I can go show to investors. Do you have somebody who can help me with that? And so through them, I started doing that consulting work and, and ended up working with, gosh, I don't know, maybe 15, 16, 17 different software companies um, over a multi-year period. Um, and, and, and just trying to really dive deep into that industry from a consulting standpoint before I took the bigger plunge as a full-time employee as a CFO. Okay, interesting. It's a pretty cool path. And so now this is around 2017 or so. How did you make your way particularly into e-clinical software? Is that where you saw the future or the most opportunity or was it by happenstance? Well, having a trading background, I've been concerned, even then, I knew that this bull market probably had just a few years left um, because it had already been fairly extended at the time. Um, and I was interested in an area of software that wouldn't be, so I was area, you know, interested in an area of software that wouldn't be cyclically, ex you know, cyclically exposed or vulnerable. Um, and, and so the, the healthcare side of that, the soft, that, that software business appealed from that sort of defensive aspects in a in sort of more troubled financial market context. And okay. so that's, that's what attracted me to healthcare. It's also, um, there's also areas of what I would call e-clinical, which is really the niche of healthcare, which is focused on drug development, new drug development, um, that area was especially fragmented. So you didn't have, you've got a couple of big players that, that sort of play in that pool, but there's a lot of other smaller players and there's lots of different applications in there. And you even have lots of people or lots of uh, clinical trial sites and pharmaceutical companies and, and whatnot that still use, that don't even use tools. So you're, you're selling into a greenfield situation with no uh, incumbent vendor. And that was also striking to me. There's not a lot of places, you know, we talked about how, how, you know, 20 years ago, you know, we started to shift away from CD-ROMs and you fast forward to today, there's, you know, it, it's SaaS is, is sort of ubiquitous and, and, you know, it's, it's every industry you can think of has got some form of digitization. And the exciting part about clinical drug, drug development part was there was still a lot of area there that just was still using Excel and paper. Um, and so I was like, gosh, this is a, this is a real kind of little gym here. Um, 
and it's growing uh, very fast every year. E-clinical grows around, it's, you know, 12 to 13 percent a year in growth. Um, so that all those things combined attracted me, you know, again, just sort of the anti the, the, the non-cyclical components of healthcare in general, the, the fragmentation down at the e-clinical level of, of trial uh, clinical trials um, and, and the secular growth rates um, put that together and, and, and it, it seemed like a pretty attractive path in the software realm to, to pursue. Yeah, it definitely does sound appealing. Like there's a lot of opportunity there. Just to take a quick step back, can you tell us exactly like what eClinical software is? I mean, I know we yeah. it has to do with, I guess, drugs and getting it out there, trying it and tracking data. Uh, but is it more than that or am I missing something? Yeah, so it's, you think about it as two constituents, it's made up of two constituencies. One is what we call the sponsors. And these are the people that really own and manage the clinical trial for a new drug. And they would be two types of organizations. They would be either a pharmaceutical company like a, a Merck or a Pfizer, or they might be called a, a CRO, which is a um, contract resource research organization. And they're really outsourced trial managers. Sometimes these big um, pharmaceutical companies don't have the bandwidth or appetite to run a trial themselves. So they will, they will pay a large company uh, like in Acuvia, there are a couple of public companies that do this, that trade on New York Stock Exchange, actually, um, to run the, the trial themselves. So those are on the sponsor side. They, 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 they sort of own and manage the trial itself. They come up with the new drug. They own the rights to the drug. And they, des they typically would design the trial. The second constituency is the actual physical trial sites where these drugs are, you know, tried out, um, you know, in a, in a clinical context through, uh, through patients, um, through subjects. Uh, and, and these would be hospital systems, university centers, cancer centers, medical centers, um, even smaller um, offices uh, of doctors and stuff like that. And so those those, they are the ones that are actually having the patients come in and, and try this new uh, either drug or, or device or diagnostic system. Um, those are the two constituencies. And there's really, in, in the early, I guess, 2000 teens, there were certainly some big software vendors, but they, they started to come in and really target those big checks at the sponsor level, because those guys can write the big multi-million dollar checks. And what our sort of co-founders noticed in 2014, 15, when, when Florence was founded was there was very little attention paid to the clinical trial sites and a couple of different reasons for that. But one of them was that they're, you know, they're smaller checks and they're, they're still a fairly difficult sale to grind out because they've got lots of data privacy agreements and things like that to ensure that patient data is protected uh, through the use of these software tools. But there wasn't a lot of tools, especially on the sort of workflow side and in content storage side of all these regulatory documents on the on the site side. And so the idea for Florence was really to to start to focus to be to be to stand out and be unique and develop a product that really caters to those those clinical trial sites. And and so that's that's where we started with with an initial product that that stores documents. Um, regulatory documents and other types of documents that the, the clinical trial site would send to the sponsor who would then submit as part of the drug application. And this product has customized workflows. It allows um, you to go audit the trail for different documents. It allows e-signatures. And it does all this in an FDA compliant way. Um, okay. And so we grinded it out there for several years and started to accumulate more and more uh, clinical trial sites in the U.S. and, and globally. Um, and it, at some point, I think it was around 2019 or so, we started to get um, inquiries from some of these sponsors who said, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm running a, a new drug, a trial for a new drug here. And I'm just noticing you guys, I'm noticing a lot of our, our trial sites are using your software. Who are you guys? And, and is there any way you could create a product that we could use to look through sort of a portal and see all the documents in all of our sites at once? And we said, oh, that's a great idea. Sure, we'd love to develop that. And so that, in, that was sort of the genesis of um, our first product that catered towards that big sponsor market. And, um, you know, just pushing for a little further when COVID hit and, you know, early 2020, that's when that product really accelerated. And we sort of had our okay. big moment in 2020 when we, we worked with Pfizer on their sort of now famous vaccine 
um, okay. with that product. And they used our product to, you know, to push out across their sites to store data around that vaccine. Uh, okay. And, that, and just to, to interrupt there, just to clarify one thing, Cooper. So what exactly is some of the process? I think that might help us kind of wrap our head around it when a Pfizer or one of these giants out there says, hey, we've got a vaccine or we've got a product uh, that, you know, we think is ready to go to market. Did they then utilize a company like Florence Healthcare to say, okay, you guys are going to track everything that we're testing. And then when we make our case or we submit our application, you're essentially like the data brain that's providing all of that? Well, it's it, it's sort of. So there's, when, it, when they come up with um, a new say, sort of a chemical or molecule that they want to go test in a clinical trial, there are, there are typically four stages or, or sometimes even more than that of, of clinical trials that test, you know, typically the efficacy in a pre or sort of before they put it into the humans themselves and they test the safety of it. And then the first phase would be to test that safety uh, in, in small doses and a small number of people. And then the next phase, the next two phases, sort of the phase two and three, and three is really the final big trial. They, they, they test and try to work out the dosage and the efficacy of the drug. Um, and so they would design those, um, they design that whole trial and then they go out and they're going to go look for, um, you know, different sites that are uh, appropriate, that would be the best fit to test that particular drug or, or device. And that, that's called sort of site selection or site fe feasibility is what you often hear in eClinical. Um, where they're going to go out and say, is this site in the demo, you know, is it going to have access to the demographic that we want or, or the ge geographic area that we want to be a good fit to give us the data on this drug? And so there's this whole site selection process that happens. And um, we're one of the things we're working on right now actually is, is, is to have, you know, kind of an, an extra part of our tool that will uh, take data from sites and allow them to make it easier for them to, to, to identify those sites. It'll be the best fit, you know, for that particular use case. Um, and so they go out and select these different uh, sites. And um, that's when our software would sort of start to kick in is when the sites start up one of these uh, clinical trial uh, phases, uh, they would start to put the regulatory documents and 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 use our our software to kind of manage those workflows around um, starting the trial itself. And then okay. as the trial proceeds, they're at the sites are adding this data into our our product. And at the end of the trial, or even during it, they would be monitored by the sponsor who's coming in to look at to make sure all the protocols are being followed, that the patients are being uh, protected, and all that stuff. And at the end of the trial, they uh, would send this data up to the sponsor. The sponsor aggregates the data from all the trials and then submits that to the FDA for a, a sort of a final uh, application. Okay. All right, good. I appreciate kind of the background there. And quick question out of curiosity. So, I mean, right now, especially since COVID and everything being so polarized, you know, people are skeptical. People are skeptical about big pharma, about the CDC, you have a, a very loud, I guess you could call it, you know, anti-vax movement that, that has their voice being heard. D do you see any impact to like what you're doing on a daily basis and to companies like yours? Is it, is it an opportunity for you or is it a hurdle for you? Like what, what is that doing? You know, it doesn't, I don't know that there's a direct impact to, to us, but there certainly is an indirect impact to the extent that People are resistant to these new technologies and solution and, and 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 cures and whatnot that that are being produced. It's you know it's really an educational challenge, I think. Um, and I've got friends here in Phoenix that are that are doctors, and and some of the stories, you know, over a drink that they've told me about reasons for patients not taking the vaccine were were comical in a sense, but also sort of tragic. I remember one doctor told me that, uh, you know, a patient didn't want to take, uh, I think, I don't remember which vaccine it was, but one of them, because she heard that there were like fetus parts in the vaccine. And we were just like, gosh, I mean, how did, how did this happen that people are so misinformed about some of these technologies? And they certainly have risks all of these drugs have risks associated with them that that people should be aware of um but you know to make it through this process um that the fda puts in place they they have to show 
cost benefit far beyond the risk uh, in, in large numbers. And that's why drugs are, you know, very expensive here in the U.S. is because it, it, it costs, it typically costs a few billion dollars to prove all that out and, and go through all those safety uh, measures and, and pass all the statistical hurdles to get to the point where you can have this available for public consumption. And occasionally you'll have a drug that comes through that still has some problems that you find out after the fact. But, you know, the majority of times it seems that, um, you know, that cost benefit is, 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 is looked at very closely by not only the sponsor, because they don't want the liability, but also the FDA um, to make sure that the, the people aren't hurt and, and that the population is, is, a, is an overall benefits. Um, but yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's an educational challenge uh, for us, uh, for the whole industry and, and getting people comfortable. These are complex, you know, now with the, the stage of medicine, I mean, especially as you get in gen genomically targeted medicines, it's very complicated science. And um, I think that, com that complexity in, in that, 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 that context of complexity, people will often create narratives that, you know, just really aren't true because they, they don't want to take the time to learn the science. And I don't necessarily blame them because it is, it is complex stuff. Uh, but for us, it's, yeah, it's really an educational challenge that I'm, I, we're, I think the whole industry is still trying to get their head around how to, uh, how to be proactive and in front of. Yeah, it's, it's such a tricky topic because I feel like it's become so anecdotal where, people feel like they are educating themselves, but then where they're getting that education from, they can question, you know, whether it's uh, people saying it's dangerous or people saying it's a cure-all, you know, it's like, well, where, show me the proof. And, and then they can debate the proof. It gets so crazy. I think one of the things and kind of a segue here that people freaked out so much about with COVID is it's like, we knew when COVID arrived here in the States and then we knew when we had an approved vaccine and it was like, how the hell did that happen so quick? Yeah. But it seemed like just the, the people, the public were like test subjects. And I know that's what everybody initially was kind of afraid of. Like, well, you guys take it first and then I'll think about it. Were, was your company, was Florence Healthcare kind of like all hands on deck, like all these big sponsors, you call them all the big development companies, Moderna, Pfizer, like all these guys, did they need you like like times a thousand during that period? Yeah. So the, the big need for us um, was was really around the I think the if I had to put one one thing at the top of the list would be the ability to monitor these clinical trials during the, the worst part of COVID, you know, call it summer of 2020 or spring of 2020. When these hospital systems were were danger zones for people to physically go in. Um, how do you, how does the pharmaceutical company stay compliant with FDA regulations in, in the sense that they have to monitor each one of these sites on a frequent basis to make sure they're following all the protocols and stuff without putting their monitors in a dangerous, uh, you know, physical environment. And that's where our software came in because all of a sudden we were able to, with our software, we had all these documents that the monitors um, could then just go into our software and see and not have to physically go into the, the trial site. And it's called remote monitoring. So that was the big enabler that, that they quickly sort of turned to us to, to want to put into place. There was always, there's always been a secular trend. And really this is again, across any industry towards digitization because of the efficiencies it brings. I mean, you can imagine, you know, for a for a trial monitor to, to not have to take an airplane and go stay in a hotel and drive a car or rent a car to go to go to go to every all these hospitals, there's savings there. And so that benefit sort of has always spoke for itself. And that was sort of the secular tailwind. But now you had like a real physical safety issue with COVID for these folks to go in and, um, you know, into 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 physically be in the hospital site. So that's where that was really the accelerant for us, I would say, the number one accelerant to get the sponsor side really excited about having our product across a number of sites um, so that they could now monitor more trials, more trial sites with the same number of monitors in a lower risk way. Um, so that was sort of the game changer for us on that side of the business. And now that business has started to become a really significant part of our overall revenue stream, which we're, we're excited about. So just to be clear, like your customers, are they the sponsors, the pharma companies, or are they all these random sites, the hospitals and, you know, they are both. Practices? So we have, yeah, they are both because we, we now have two products. Um, really, we have several products, but I would say two that really um, 
two are sort of our, our, our kind of biggest products in both those constituencies. Um, one is custom, you know, made for the sponsor use case to be able to go in and look at all the trend, all the sites for one drug study in one easy portal. And, and be able to exchange information and documents with those sites back and forth and monitor those sites. The other product is really more customized for the actual sites where this product allows them to, uh, you know, have all of their, their data and information organized in these sort of this, this sort of folder or binder hierarchy in our tool that also customizes workflows, gives some analytics, allows for e-signatures that the FDA will accept. So for doctors to be able to sign documents using our tool instead of having to do pen and paper, uh, that alone saves time. And again, that sort of interface between a nurse physically or a whoever the CR, the, uh, the clinical trial uh, associate is in that hospital site and the doctor. Um, so that second product, uh, you know, the, the, the tar that's a really our original product targets the sites themselves and is very customized for that use case. Okay. And now these, the big companies, so the sponsors, is this something that you foresee them trying to do in house at some point? Um, you know, kind um, of cutting out the middleman, you know if you will, or? Yeah, I think, it's, it, you know, you. I would break the sponsors, I would even bifurcate them into those two constituencies I mentioned earlier, which are the CRO groups. And these are, these are companies that are, that are for-profit businesses that, that they, they go to the big pharmaceutical companies of the world and say, hey, you know, we're here for you. If you don't want to run this trial yourself, pay us and we will we will run it for you and we can, we can do it maybe even better than you because we have this cool tech stack. And so we've, you know, as part of that, those groups have started to develop their own technologies to try to sell their services as really good trial operators. And so that's a different sell for us in a sense um, to say, hey, you should include our product as part of your tech stack because we think it'll give you a competitive edge when you're marketing your ability to run trials versus other folks in the CRO business. On the pharmaceutical side, there seems there's a, they're certainly very interested in running the you know the best uh, the most efficient trials possible and using the best technology. But their their biggest focus is more on the molecule and the drug itself. And so they're they're still interested in it. It's just a bit of a different sell to them um, than it is the CRO side. And you haven't seen necessarily the, the, techno the in-house technology development on, on the big pharmaceutical side for, for trial development as you have on that CRO side, which would make sense. Cause I mean, those guys are out trying to sell themselves and saying, hey, we're, we're the best operators and, 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 and our tech stack is part of what makes it so. Okay. And now it, it seems like the sky's the limit. I mean, there's just, endless vaccines being made, new medical devices, et cetera. And we mentioned like in your intro here, Florence has been literally doubling uh, every year for a number of years now. Mm -hmm. Like, are there, what do you see as, I guess, a threat to this industry in the future or to you guys? Is it competition, regulation, or are you guys just like on cruise control right now? Well, I think the regulation, we try to look at it as, is a positive thing. It, it can, it, you know, it's certainly a moat around e-clinical because there's this uh, body of regu regulations that the FDA has created around the use of, um, you know, uh, software in clinical trials to store data that we have, you know, so far successfully navigated. And we, we also, you know, sometimes help our clients navigate it. Um, so it can almost be its own moat to keep other, you know, startups um, from, from messing with the space. Um, I would say, you know, and then, you know, the, the, the next sort of phase of, of the industry is probably towards data, if I had to guess. And I'm certainly not a, a subject matter expert. Um, I, would, I would defer to our, our, some of our folks internally for that. But I think data continues to be a big deal. Um, being able to take all the different um, user activity uh, the, you know, um, the different um, sort of di the different sort of inter inter interfaces and interactions with the trial between the different the different uh, parties that are involved and taking that and, and translating that into analytics and insights to make trials run better is a big deal. Um, and so I think there's a path there to to to, you know, it's all about sort of providing an edge, as we used to say in Wall Street when we we're trading. Um, providing that edge to the trial operator through through data, probably. There, the other big piece is, is demographics. There's a lot of 
Um, you know, the majority of the, the, tr the clinical trial sites are in heavily populated areas and, and they're also sort of demographically skewed and not as diverse as they could be. And a lot of the drugs today have different effects in, in different gene pools. And so that's another big focus is how do you kind of improve diversity in trials? Um, those would be two of the, the sort of the, the, the top things that come to mind in terms of um, you know, how to, to, how to provide an edge maybe in the future to, to clinical trial operations and make them more efficient and more effective. Um, so I think the FDA has generally been, been very accommodated to, to, to our industry and, you know, they're wanting to, um, for us to, in the industry to create the, the best drugs and safest drugs, most effective drugs as possible, but do it in a safe way. Uh, and again, I think we've used that as an enabler. Um, the competition side would be probably the other, the only other piece, as you mentioned, um, there are a couple of big incumbents there, but there's still a lot of room for innovation and, and, and we are very nimble. We have smart people, um, and we can move very quickly to pivot around shifts in the industry or to, to come up with new products. Um, and I think that's maybe an advantage we have over some of those bigger companies, which can move slower. The other thing I would say is a lot of these guys, um, despite our success, are still very focused, especially the big software companies on the pharmaceutical companies. And so a lot of times they'll come out with products that do really well in that pharmaceutical space, but the sites, they haven't really consulted the sites about it. And the physical trial sites have to use that product and they'll run into adoption problems um, because they don't do that sort of check first and develop it develop these products with the site first mentality. And that's, I think, another sort of edge of us. We've always thought of ourselves as the champion of the clinical trial sites. And so we kind of come at things from that direction and try to, try to divide, try to create things that we know that sites will love, that will make their day easier. And if we do that, then, um, and the sites love it, we know the pharmaceutical companies will love it too. Gotcha. Okay. So as we're going through all this, this is really interesting information, but it seems like it's a pretty wide ranging conversation that you touch on a lot of different areas of the industry of what you guys are doing, the products that you're building. It almost, I know your title is CFO, but it mm -hmm. sounds like you, you wear a few different hats here. At least you get exposure to a lot of kind of yeah. new technology. Do you get like in your role, do you step kind of out of that lane a lot, or is this just things that you kind of hear on the periphery of uh, what's going on? Yeah, I think there's been a shift in the in the whole role of CFO, you know, concurrent with the whole SAS uh, timeline, more or less, too, where I think, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, CFOs were, were really sort of stuck in, in sort of that finance and accounting silo. And I think today, um, in today's world, at least my experience uh, in software is that role is much, the CFO role can be much broader and is you're, you know, I'm involved with a lot more of the strategic decisions, you know, what direction to go in with the company um, and things far broader than, than just the finance piece, which, which I love. I mean, I, I love the operational aspects about how to make the business more productive. I love the, the being able to, 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 to give that strategic input. And you'll often see, you know, in job descriptions or when I have recruiters reach out to me, they, they use this term strategic CFO. And that's, that's, I think, been also a paradigm shift in finance as, as the CFO's role has, is now looked as almost like a right-hand person or an advisor to the CEO for things. You know, obviously everything falls back to finance. It's the core of, you know, why the business exists. But being able to take that and, and help guide the vision um, and, and direction of the company is, is, is sort of the new sort of uh, strategic CFO uh, archetype, if you will. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's made my role a lot more exciting and engaging versus, you know, just reporting on the financials every month, which is, you know, maybe what C CFOs did 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah, no, I can imagine that is exciting because it's, I always tell people and then I talk a lot about on the show that it all comes back to dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. So it's, if you ignore that, you know, you might chase a, a passion or a great idea, but eventually, you know, you might go bankrupt at the same time. So it's, uh, I think it has a direct impact on all the decision making. So it's, it's cool to kind of bring that in as that hybrid uh, strategic CFO, as you called it. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's awesome. That's, that's right. So, yeah, every yeah, you got to have a core. Everything's got to have a, a sort of finance justification at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and so you you still need that core skill set there and being able to sort of come back to saying, okay, is this thing really great idea, uh, cool direction, or 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 this sounds fun, but at the end of the day, does it pencil out? Uh, does this math work? And so you're you're sort of still that backbone to to do that check before you get too far with stuff, but. You're certainly able to, you know, to be involved in that process and, and sort of sketching out that roadmap. Yeah, no, that's that is really cool. I, that sounds like a fun job too. And now, if let's just say, if I'm an investor listening to the show right now, it, it sounds like all of this stuff is growing. It's happening quickly. It's got a combination of good financials and the future of technology. And uh, and you mentioned that at the outset, one of the reasons you went in this direction is because it's not so cyclical. So. Mm-hmm. What what maybe do you see? I mean, is this a place that an investor wants to look at at like an e-clinical software company such as yourself? Or are you seeing other uh, trends maybe in healthcare that people should be aware of or perhaps dig a little deeper on? I think, I mean, I think, you know, unfortunately, I think for the average retail investor, you know, e-clinical is still such in its nascent that there, there certainly are several public companies or, 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 you know, maybe more than that, a handful that, that are sort of ways to play those trends. Um, I do think you will see more, uh, you know, public offerings in this space over the next five years as some of these companies get to the critical mass where they start to look uh, to the public markets. Um, uh, but I still think in healthcare, the technology angle is the most exciting way you know, for me as, as an investor, in a sense, because we have stock options at Florence uh, to play the space, um, you're not because, you know, on the drug development side, I mean, it's unless you're betting on a very large pharmaceutical company, which has many bets out there at once, uh, especially the smaller, you know, um, pharmaceutical and biotech companies, um, it, it's a very technical uh, sort of investment in the sense that you really have to, you're really betting on whether a certain molecule works um, versus the uh, the technology side where, you know, it's really facilitating all this stuff in a, in a more efficient and effective, effective way. So, you know, you know, looking at it from an investment or investor standpoint, I think that that part's the, the more exciting piece. It's almost like, the, you know, sort of the, the owning the casino analogy where you have these different uh, pharmaceutical companies coming to your table and placing bets and uh, on different drugs and they, they may win or lose, but the casino is already always taking their take of every interaction. And, and, you know, you're just sort of facilitating them being able to, to place those bets in a better way and hopefully increasing their odds. Um, and, and that's sort of the way I, you know, I would view healthcare is, is if you're going to be an investor there um, I really like the uh, you know, the technology, the, the, the companies that facilitate a technological edge in healthcare. Um, not to say the healthcare companies aren't great investments. Some of them have, do, have done terrific um, and, and that's its own world for sure. Um, but it's a technical one that you really need to kind of know your, your, your drugs and, and, and your markets for those drugs, um, I think to be successful in over time. Yeah. And that was a great analogy of kind of owning the casino. So from that standpoint, you would just to be clear, you would look at these different pharma companies as the ones stepping up to the table, placing a, a bet, if you will, on a new breakthrough drug or vaccine and so forth. Whereas the technology guys that are just absorbing all of this, you know, such as yourself, uh, you're more of the casino. Is that who you would put in that category? Yeah, and I hate to I hate to say that that they're gamblers. And maybe that's an extreme <laughs> analogy, but you yeah, know they are in a sense. I mean, yeah. in, a, in in a sense, they are. I don't mean in a bad way at all towards what they're doing, but yeah, I mean it's it's just a way to it's an analogy I think that that compartmentalizes the risk that technology takes versus the risk that the new drug, you know, the, the new drug and that, that starting a new drug involves, and and the risk that technology takes is is just some, is one of more of, of adoption and competition. Whereas, you know, drug development is a much more uh, complicated risk to get your head around about whether a, a molecule will be, you know, effective, whether it will be safe, can it make it through four clinical 
you know, st uh, stages of develop of, of testing? And then is it going to be better than what's already out there? You know, it's uh, there's a lot of uncertainties. And that's where, you know, again, the, the risk reward can be huge. If you do find one of those biotech companies, and you think it, it can it can work and it pays off. I mean, you can make 100 to one on your money. But then there's the other, you know, uh, the other all the other 99 situations where, uh, you know, it doesn't pay off and, and the drug doesn't make it through. And, and most yeah. drugs do fail, um, you know, and, and that's that's probably a good thing because you don't want to have drugs that aren't effective, or aren't safe out there. But it also makes the, the betting odds as an investor, um, you know, a bit more challenging um, to to hit hit the hit a big one on. Yep. And along those lines, just to kind of compare the two sides, I know you hear so much talk about patents, you know, with pharma companies or with new medications and things that they make this tremendous investment in time and assets to hopefully hit that home run and, and come out with a new drug that does so much good. So on your side, as you develop a, uh, a certain process or a technology that can do all the things you've explained to date, do you guys have patents on this or is it something that a competitor can kind of spend some money, get in there, you know, get compliant with the FDA and all those regulations and then boom, tomorrow you've got yourself a new competitor? Oh, for sure. Yeah, we definitely, uh, you know, try to get anything that we can patented and get intellectual, uh, you know, um, property protection around what we do. Um, and that can certainly offer some protection, um, but it's, you know, just like any of these industries in SaaS or software, um, there are, you know, people can do variations of what you do or, or, or add wrinkles to it and maybe circumvent some of that. So the key is, you know, not to stand still. And that's the challenge. And also the thing that makes this industry fun to be an employee in is that you have to constantly innovate to keep the width of that moat wide enough to, to, to maintain or gain market share. Um, if you stand still very quickly, you can see examples throughout the last 20 years of what happens um, as other folks will innovate and or, you know, basically replicate what you have with some wrinkles in there and then they'll innovate and they'll quickly take share. Um, so the key is to always be moving forward towards improvement, um, towards getting better, towards towards having that edge over other products. And it distills down through the whole culture, I think, in, in software, which is, again, why I like the industry as a whole. It's that sort of constant improvement uh, ethic that, that you see here that we're always trying to be better, to create something that does something better to, you know, at the end of the day, it keeps us ahead of the competition. But um, it results in a, in a very kind of, I think, a, a, a fun, fast moving, dynamic culture that requires us to stay agile and and read trends and, 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 and react very quickly to them when, when shifts, when, when there are big shifts in the industry. Understood. And now a kind of a follow-up question, I think will help tie all of this together. Um, so recently on the show, we had uh, Christopher Volk, who's a real guru known internationally for raising capital using mm -hmm. other people's money. He did it all in REITs, you know, real estate investment trusts and things of that nature. So when we talk about, you know, you want to widen that moat so that you can kind of fend off competition by always innovating, always changing, always improving, that takes money in it, building a larger company with more talent and more employees. Going back to kind of your wheelhouse as CFO, how do you guys raise capital and grow? Is that all through reinvestment of profits? Um, are you using private equity? Are you going to become one of these public companies one day or? you know, what is that next step to keep adding to the pot? Yeah, we, you know, it's the other thing that's cool about software is there, it, we're valued at least today and, and, and valuation metrics can change over time in industries, but software is typically valued off of revenue and revenue growth. So that, that you know, that contrasts, you know, uh, starkly, I think, to what a lot of people learn in business school, which is, you know, that, that companies are valued off of profits and say free cash flow generation um, at least at an early stage up to sort of growth stage, software is, is um, software companies are valued on, on, on that top line. And so, you know, what we call price to sales ratios. Uh, and you can see that in some of the public markets too, for instance, like a sales force and whatnot often referred to in price to sales versus price to earnings. Um, so you're looking at, at ways to always keep that revenue growth rate high 
Uh, and, and you want that, not only that growth rate to be high, but you want that the composition of the revenue to be what I call quality, meaning it, it has the maximum amount of that recurring revenue stream, that license stream that we talked about earlier, uh, that, that sort of annuitized uh, you know, subscription revenue as possible. Um, and so you're, that's sort of the, the, the top filter for, for new projects and whatnot. And also how we frame uh, our investment case to other investors when we're wanting to raise. Um, we're, we just did our Series C. And so, yes, we're, you know, as you move up to Series C and D, you start to move from what are called venture capital uh, investors to more private equity investors. Uh, and there's sort of, um, you know, differing definitions of, of what those, those two different fund investors look for and typically invest in. Um, but we're sort of moving now towards the stage, especially with the Series C, where we're starting to move towards bigger private equity investment companies um, that would, you know, take us to that next stage of growth and revenue um, and, and, you know, always start to reassess, you know, what, what's the next, what's the best path to continue that? Is it to go to public markets where we get the best are we gonna get the best valuation multiple there? Is it to uh, even go to another person, or another group in the in the same industry, and 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 look and see if there's a strategic investor, or is it to stay with private equity? Uh, and that's you know a, a complicated decision, but you know at, at Series C, that's sort of where we're at. Is we're we've we've started to move to more of that that private equity group, those bigger investment funds that work with more mature companies. Um, and then from here, yeah, you could you could go any one of those three directions, strategic, private equity, or potentially public markets, if, if it made sense. Got it. Yeah. So it sounds like you have options. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's uh, No, that's great. Well, Cooper, this has been really, really informative, uh, especially for someone that's not too familiar with, with kind of this healthcare space. And I know a lot of people ask, you know, like when someone creates a, a vaccine or a molecule, like you said, what happens? Like, where does it all go? I think you really clarified a lot of that process. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners about e-clinical software or the healthcare industry that, you know, is on the future or that people maybe don't know that they should know? Well, I think, again, it's, it's that it's, it's, to me, the most exciting thing is the data. And I actually, during COVID, um, got a, a, a a post-grad cert, cert in data science to really understand it and be able to be conversant when we get to that stage. But I think the future will be, you know, again, um, running these trials more effectively using data and, and using that not only for running the trials themselves to, 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 to make them the most efficient and quicker and, and less expensive for pharmaceutical companies, but also to include the most people and a very wide spectrum of, of demographic in there so that we get the best, you know, the, the, the drugs uh, tested in the best way possible. So to me, that's kind of a fun um, path, not only for the industry, but also for humans in general, to the extent that we can get, you know, um, better technology out to folks to, to cure things in, in a faster and less expensive way. No, that's great. Maybe the last question I have here, if you don't mind, sure. as you, you talk, there's so many things that come to mind here. Like when we say data, I could go on about data security and things I'm sure folks are concerned about in that regard. But bringing it back to, I think, the, the elephant in the room, which is some of the skepticism that people mm -hmm. have for the industry right now. Mm -hmm. when, when you guys run, collect all of this data and, and you provide it to your customers, Mm -hmm. Is there wiggle room there for them to essentially kind of massage the data or the results to put it in a more positive light? Because nobody wants to hear that, you know, you've compiled data that is negative, that is going against their case. I think that's something a lot of people kind of wonder, like, are we getting to see all the data or do they cherry pick the data that fits their narrative? And that's what we see. If you could maybe just kind of concisely if you know, kind of uh, explain maybe how that's handled. Yeah, I mean, that you know, it's 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 certainly a valid uh, concern to bring up. And look, I mean, I think all of us in the industry, uh, our clients and ourselves as well, um, you know, have biases, uh, you know, towards our own products. And uh, we're going to look to confirm those biases in certain cases um, that might... Um, you know, uh, not give a full picture or the picture that people want to see. Um, I think that's where, you know, we would sort of lean on the FDA and, and, and what they've done to create the protocols and frameworks around trials 
to to really kind of you know force integrity in in the into those into these trials to make sure that that all the data is included, uh, the good and the bad, uh, and that a, a fair, unbiased decision is made at the end of the day. That that really the only bias is towards making sure people are safe first and foremost, and secondly, you know, making sure the drug is uh, the drug do, does what it's supposed to do in, 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 in a better way than what's out there today. So, um, you know, I think the, in a day, in a, in a, the, today's era, it's tough because there's so much information now and there's so much information from different sources. And it's, I think people are, um, it's almost confusing and overwhelming and it's easy sure. for people to get sucked into, uh, I don't know, narratives and things, uh, especially in social media that um, just aren't, aren't right or are coming from uh, sources that um, it's hard to check and, and know if, if they're right, or you might think that they're biased. Uh, uh, and, and, and I think it's healthy to be skeptical as a consumer of, of anything. Um, and so I think a little, I think healthy skepticism is a good thing uh, for people. Um, but when it goes to a certain point and you think everybody's out to get you, it becomes an unhealthy thing. So I think it's something as, you know, within the drug industry, um, we would we would sort of lean on the um, continue to lean on the, the FDA to, to help us to uh, stay on the right road there. But as a society, it's a much more complex, tougher issue that you know is is hard to hard to answer today. You know where where that where that ends up and sort of how do you par how do you as the average consumer of, of information parse through what what to believe and what what not to believe? Yeah, no, I think that was well said. It seems like the data, the information is certainly there. It's it's making sense of it and being able to understand what it's telling you. Mm -hmm. um, that that's yeah, that's always the ultimate goal. Yeah. So, well, Cooper, thank you very much for for coming on the show. Uh, it gave us a lot to think about, and I think we learned a lot today, um, especially for a novice in the space. So, I, I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, without a doubt. Well, everyone, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Kaderna podcast. Today, we just heard from Cooper Anderson, the CEO, CFO of Florence Healthcare. And keep on tuning in. If you have any questions, suggestions, recommendations, just reach out to us at the Kaderna podcast at gmail.com. And we will see you next time. Take care. This podcast is intended for the general public and for informational purposes only. The show does not provide any recommendations or investment advice regarding any specific account type, service, strategy, or product, or to otherwise act in any fiduciary or other capacity. Please contact a financial professional for guidance and information that is specific to your situation. Brian Kaderna does not provide tax or legal advice. Please contact your accountant or legal advisor to discuss your situation. Guest speakers and their firms are not affiliated with or endorsed by Park Avenue Securities, Guardian, or Kaderna Financial Team, and opinions stated are their own. All investments contain risk and may lose value. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. References to specific securities, asset classes, and financial markets are for illustrative purposes only and do not constitute a solicitation, offer, or recommendation to purchase or sell a security. Brian Kaderna is a registered representative and financial advisor of Park Avenue Securities, LLC, PAS, OSJ, 300 Broadacres Drive, Suite 175, Bloomfield, New Jersey, 07003. Phone number 973-244-4420. Securities products and advisory services offered through PAS, member FINRA, SIPC. Financial representative of the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, New York, New York. PAS is a wholly owned subsidiary of Guardian. Kaderna Financial Team is not an affiliate or subsidiary of PAS or Guardian. California Insurance License Number 0K04194.